Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, I was kind of hoping for a good afternoon, Dr. King. Can we do that again? Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, Dale just made me so happy. Thank you for being here. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you all today about trauma, the brain, healing, all of the things. Uh, before I get started, I just want to encourage you all to consider what you might need in order to feel supported over the course of our time together. So for folks in the room, you may notice we have little buckets called regulation stations full of fidget toys on your table. These are sensory supports that you might find helpful as we move through our content today. Um, there's water and snacks, folks here who are online. Just consider what it might be helpful to have close to you as we move through our time together today. So part of a trauma-informed approach is being sure that folks know what's going to happen before it happens. We like predictability and transparency. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of the pieces I'm hoping to talk to you about today. Uh, we'll create some shared language, talk a bit about the impact of trauma on the brain and the nervous system, and explore the unique power of relationships in helping to heal and build resilience in individuals and in communities. So it would not be appropriate to give a talk that touches on trauma in any way without acknowledging the multitude of collective and systemic traumas occurring currently alongside ongoing assaults on the humanity of historically and intentionally excluded and uh, under-resourced groups, as well as the history of violence and harm that this country was built on. Um, what I'm sharing today, too, is being filtered through my lens as a white cis -het woman with academic training, clinical training, and lived experience of being harmed and also harming. So the idea today is to present information to you in a way that will allow you to think about it critically and also take away what might work for you and for your practice. So many of you are likely familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences study done more than 20 years ago now between um, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, so they were looking at um, health outcomes and the connection between health outcomes later in life and experiences of adversity during childhood. So they were interested specifically in the 10 experiences that you see in those teal circles there, different types of abuse, different types of neglect, and different types of what they called household challenges, things like being exposed to inner partner violence or substance use in the home, those kind of things. Lots of important findings came out of this study. For our purposes today, I just want to highlight a couple. Uh, the first being that of their 17,000 person sample, more than two thirds responded that they had experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And one in five reported that they had experienced three or more. Um, it established a clear connection between adversity in childhood and the risk for physical and mental health issues later in life, and the piece I really want you to hang on to is the idea that it established a dose-response relationship between ACEs and the number and severity of, of potential health issues later in life. So the more ACEs, the more risk for health issues later on. Kind of hang on to that because we're going to come back to it um, a little later during our time together. So while the ACE study is a really important one and has been helpful in uh, building awareness about the impact of childhood trauma over the course of the lifetime, um, it's also pretty deeply flawed in a few different ways. A key one being that the ACE study looked specifically at individual and household level adversities, right? And we know, as social workers, that we have to consider person and environment, we have to consider the systems and structures and policies and laws that have been created to establish and sustain inequity. So what I love about this graphic is that it gets at these sort of three different realms of ACEs. So the individual or household level ACEs you can see as the branches on that tree and in the roots are um, some of the more systemic and, systemic and structural traumas that face communities. And the third piece being environmental traumas. So so things like climate change, um, 
the pandemic would fall under this area. I think that this just offers a little more comprehensive and holistic view of the impact of ACEs kind of all over the place. So moving away from ACEs and into trauma specifically, so can we define trauma? We can try. Um, where I think it gets trickier, one of the reasons that defining is tricky uh, is that we use that word often to describe both a thing that happened and a response or reaction to a thing that happened. And so it feels kind of messy, it feels kind of confusing. I really like this SAMHSA definition, those three E's that you see there. So considering an event, a series of events or a set of circumstances that is experienced as overwhelming or threatening in some way and has both short and long-term effects. Um, I also really like Corrine Bell's definition um, as you know the person who had the experience gets to define it, right? And so it offers a lot of flexibility to consider trauma as anything that was too much, too soon, or too fast for us to process and integrate. So prior to the pandemic, uh, more than half of adults reported at least one lifetime traumatic events. And for those of us who have worked in behavioral health or mental health services or fields, um, more than 90% endorsed experiencing trauma, which I think is accurate to my experience in clinical work. Now since the pandemic, unfortunately, um, we can safely say that 100% of us have experienced at least one lifetime traumatic event, though, uh, of course, we've been impacted by it differently. So unfortunately, you know, trauma is the norm. And it's important that we stop always thinking about someone's response or reaction to a traumatic event or experience as a disorder, as something that we can diagnose, as something that we pathologize, um, having a response to a stressful event does not automatically mean that a person is sick and does not automatically mean that a person has post-traumatic stress disorder or any other diagnosis. This is especially important as we think about folks who've experienced chronic race-based or identity-based microaggressions, implicit bias, systemic racism throughout their entire lives, as well as, you see the bottom two uh, pieces of that pyramid there, the lives of their parents and grandparents due to what we know about generational trauma and the embodiment of that across generations. I want to offer, too, a definition of collective trauma. Um, this one comes from Kai Erickson and is speaking to um, the feeling of a tense threat and overwhelming stress that instills fear, erodes safety, and really also erodes our connectedness with one another. The COVID-19 pandemic fitting, I think, the description of collective trauma. So. The research, a research team led by my colleague, Dr. Holmes, uh, has gathered a lot of data about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health over the course of time. So what you see on this slide is just one snapshot um, of what folks were dealing with. This was the spring of 2020 through the winter of 2021. And so what you see there are high rates of trauma symptoms, of depression and of anxiety. Um, this, I think, is somewhat striking and has stayed relatively consistent over time with some variation depending on you know, what exact period of time we were looking at. I share this just to say that we know the pandemic has affected everybody differently, but that many of us have been in distress over the, the course of the past two years, two plus years at this point. And what I think is relevant about that to our topic today is that we know that traumatic experiences can impact the brain and the nervous system. So what you see here, this upside down sort of pyramid, um, is meant to represent a very oversimplified <laughs> version of the brain. So I am not a neuroscientist. Uh, and I think neuroscientists would say that this is highly oversimplified, but it's still relevant, it's still important. So we're gonna look at it together. Um, so what you see on the right-hand side there, those categories um, are essentially the different functions that different parts of the brain are responsible for. So the brain stem there being responsible for our most uh, important, but pretty simple, survival functions, regulating heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, those sorts of things. And you might notice, if you look at the right-hand side of that diagram, 
that those functions increase in complexity as you go up, right? The more basic at the bottom, the more sophisticated at the top. So the brain develops in that way. It, it develops from the bottom up and as a hierarchy. Again, with the more simple functions at the bottom and the more sophisticated ones at the top. And it does so through pattern repetitive activity and stimulation in the context of our relationships. So the idea is the parts of the brain that receive stimulation change, grow, develop, and the parts that don't do not or develop much more slowly, right? The concept of neuroplasticity tells us that the brain has the potential to change over the entire course of our lifetime. There are kind of sensitive windows or critical windows where we anticipate more important developing, development happening. So specifically zero to five, there's an immense amount of neurobiological growth that occurs during those first few years. So what you see across the bottom there, those colorful boxes, calm alert, alarm, fear, and terror, you might notice correspond to the colors of those different parts of the brain. Right? That is because the part of the brain that is sort of running the show when you're in that specific state matches. So for example, when we experience something stressful, threatening, or overwhelming in our environment, either our external environment or our internal environment, our core regulatory networks in those blue circles make really quick and to us unconscious decisions about which parts of the brain to sort of turn on and off. And so in the case of fear, when the stress response is activated and we are in a fearful state, the diencephalon and cerebellum are running the show and any part above that becomes inaccessible to us, okay? So I wanna look at that in a little bit of a different way in the moment. We're also going to come back to the arousal continuum that's on the bottom there. Um, but it's just important for us to remember that the way that the brain changes is through this pattern repetitive rhythmic stimulation that happens more um, comprehensively in the context of our relationships. So I wanna show you one of my favorite little tools that I teach students, I have taught my own kids, we do in trainings all the time. A couple folks in the room are already taking their hands out, you all know what's coming. Uh, we can use our hands to create a, a really quick and simple model of the brain that I have found to be very effective in helping folks understand what exactly is happening when the stress response is activated and what's realistic and what's not to expect of somebody who is in a highly kind of activated or dysregulated state. So, y'all can do this with me. And if you're watching online, no one's gonna know if you're doing it or not, so. Um, we can think of the wrist as the spinal cord and the bottom of the hand then as the brain stem. So remember, that's the survival stuff. That's our blood pressure, that's our heart rate, those kind of things. As we travel up, that's where we get into the limbic area, the diencephalon. You can cross your thumb over, that's the amygdala. The amygdala works as sort of like a parking gate, helping to determine where this information heads afterwards. That's where our reactivity, our strong emotional response lives. Our fingers then represent the cortex, the most sophisticated part of the brain. That's the part of the brain that helps us to think and plan and problem solve and have compassion and be rational and all of that stuff, right? So when all parts of the brain are working together, when our nervous system is regulated, it's like a fist. And right here, this part of the cortex would be right at the center of your forehead here, right? Now, when something in the environment, some sort of data enters the system that's deemed threatening, overwhelming, what happens is those core regulatory networks and the amygdala shoot the cortex offline, flip the lid, so to speak, deeming the cortex inaccessible to us. So if you look at this, what do we have access to? We have access to our survival functions and we have access to our reactivity. What we don't have access to is our ability to reason, be logical, think things through, make a plan. So I want you to think for a moment about how we generally respond to somebody who's like this. Many of the ways that we approach a person who is in a highly activated, dysregulated state is counterintuitive, right? We may 
try to reason with the person. We may tell the person to calm down. Hopefully you don't do that. <laughs> we, know, we know that that's not effective. Um, we, we are trying to access in a lot of ways the parts of the brain that are sort of offline. The other thing to consider is how you respond when you're like this. Right? So if you are in conflict with somebody else, if you are experiencing your own discomfort around other folks whose lids are flipped, you raise your voice or you kind of puff up your posture as your own response to your activation, you are signaling further threat to the other person, right? So if we can't access the cortex in order to help folks become back into a, a more regulated state, what can we access? We can access the brainstem, and in doing so, we may have a little more access to that emotional reactive part of the brain, right? So we wanna think about sort of a bottom-up approach to helping folks who are highly activated and highly dysregulated come back into a more regulated state. So take that one with you. Teach it to folks. Explain that this is why we don't reason with somebody who is highly dysregulated or activated. So this corresponds with that colorful um, stress response ar arousal continuum that we saw a couple slides back. I want to mention this um, just to say that the more threatening an experience is, the quicker we kind of move through this continuum, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is we all have sort of a baseline arousal state. And that's different depending on the pattern and experiences of stress, trauma, and adversity in your own life. I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. But I also wanna highlight flock. So many of us have heard of fight, flight, freeze. Flock is probably the least well-known of our stress responses. It's also the first one you would do if I did something really weird up here. <laughs> if I said something wild or I suddenly ran away, the first thing you would probably do is kind of side-eye the person next to you. Like, did, that, did she really just do that? Did that just happen? It's this sort of social referencing that we do to try to get a sense of how threatening a situation is or is not. So to take a step back, um, stress is not inherently bad. Stress is what helps us to learn, helps us to grow, um, and in some cases, depending on the pattern, helps to build our brains, right? What matters is the intensity and the, the sort of dose of stress that's really significant. So think about the stress that's associated with doing a big new thing. So maybe that big new thing is taking a test or having an interview, or asking someone on a date, or giving a talk in front of people. Um, you may feel the activation of the stress response as you approach that thing happening. That's like the butterflies in your stomach, the heart rate speeding up, that kind of stuff. But once the big new thing happens, the stress peaks and then dissipates, right? And you kind of come back down to baseline. What you learn then is that you can tolerate some nervous system activation, right? You can tolerate a little bit of stress and that helps to build resilience in the nervous system. The problem comes in when stress is unpredictable, when the dose is too big, when it's uh, prolonged, and when we don't have time to kind of recover before the next stressful thing happens. Our stress responses then can become sensitized and we may no longer have calm as a baseline state. All right, so I wanna repeat some of those characteristics of stress that uh, can do some damage in terms of our own uh, nervous systems and our responses. Stress that's unpredictable, stress that's chronic, stress that's ongoing, can lead our nervous systems to become sensitized, which shifts our baseline state along this continuum here. So you'll notice I have highlighted alarm there. As you can see at the top, both the developmental stage row and the age row highlight how we might be behaving when we are in each of these states. So I wanna note that the pandemic fits this pattern of stress that is chronic, ongoing, unpredictable, and severe, right? Many of us are functioning in a constant low-level alarm state at this point. For folks with significant trauma prior to the pandemic, uh, they may be functioning in a low-level fear state. The point is, we are all acting like children at this point. We 
are likely more reactive, we are likely more impatient, we are likely more easily distracted, we might have a harder time focusing than we used to. A show of hands if any of this is kind of resonating in yourselves or the folks that you're close with, right? And that means that at this point, we often have expectations of ourselves and of each other that are unrealistic and neurobiologically pretty disrespectful, right? So let's shift gears for a minute uh, and start to think about how we can support ourselves and support each other as we cope with all of this ongoing trauma and stress. So a really exciting piece of um, research that has come out of the trauma field in the last 10 or 15 years is this idea of relational health. So you can think of relational health along a spectrum from being relationally wealthy to relationally poor. And what we're looking at is not just the quantity of connections that you have with other people, but also the quality of that connectedness and how much access you have to those connections. So if we think back to, I know, no one has, we're all like this, right? We're all stressed out, so your cortexes aren't online. I want to remind you about that dose-response relationship with ACEs and health issues, right? That's what's represented by this grayscale graph in the background there. You can see the very clear line between ACE score and the mean number of comorbid outcomes or multiple physical mental health issues. So when we compare the number of ACEs a person has experienced, and the number of adverse outcomes that they have in their lives, we see a higher number, right, of each. But when relational health is taken into account, the picture really, really changes. So research, research has found that when we think about relational health and overlay those scores on top of this ACE score dose, dose response relationship, we see that, if you look at that yellow line, a person with an ACE score of four begins to look like a person with an ACE score of zero. So what we know is that our degree of connectedness with one another functions as a buffer against traumatic experiences and experiences of adversity. So your history of connectedness is actually a better predictor of your health than your history of trauma and adversity. So the neurobiological basis of relational health relates directly to what we've talked about already. Our brains hold really powerful associations between rhythm, relational presence, and regulation that begin in utero, right? So I can share with you that um, at the time of the initial COVID-19 lockdown, so March of 2020, I was almost eight months pregnant with my daughter. And like all medical care, my, apartment, my appointments switched to being virtual, right? So at my last in-person OB appointment, I was sent home with a blood pressure cuff and with a fetal Doppler so that I could monitor my heart rate and baby's heart rate. Um, and if you've ever carried a child or you have been close to someone who has carried a child, you might have a sense of just how distracting it is to have access to one of those fetal Dopplers all the time. Uh, I will just say that I eavesdropped on her really often, like a lot, a lot more often than I needed to. But I was struck each time by the rhythm within which she was living and developing, right? So the sound of her heartbeat, the cadence of my heartbeat, kind of the whoosh of the fluid in the womb. In that process, she was coming to associate rhythm with safety and with relationship. And when she was born, when she encountered stress in the form of an unmet need, so hunger, thirst, wet diapers, that kind of stuff, ideally a regulated caregiver, which was not always me, um, the caregiver doesn't have to be mom, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, biologically, many in a community of carers are able to kind of with warmth and rhythm meet this need, do so, right? So you've probably seen the rhythm that's involved in this and the sensory stimulation that's involved in this. Think of the ways that you soothe a crying baby, right? You might pat the back or rub the back, you might bounce them, you might sing to them, you might walk around with them. There's all of this rhythm, relationship, and 
regulation that comes together really early and then strengthens over time. So the more that this happens, the more we learn that people are positive, people are safe, and that rhythm is soothing to us. We come to very much prefer being in the company of our people. We are truly sort of wired for connection and for community. So you can probably right now think of someone whose mere presence just puts you at ease. The person doesn't have to say a word to you, but just sharing space with them is enough to kind of get you into a more regulated place. Now, there are people who do the opposite too, but we're, we're not going to talk about those people right now. Um, we, our, our, our nervous systems respond to one another. So if we are in sort of a regulated state, it's possible that we can spread that to the people around us through co-regulation. There's a neurobiological basis for all of this. So let's take a few moments here to consider how we can apply all of this to our own care and keeping and the care and keeping of our people and our communities. So first I want to note that it is possible to stimulate your own neural networks and soothe your own stress response to go from this to this. I like to say that we can rewire our brains in this way, but again, I think actual neuroscientists would say that that's oversimplistic. The best ways to do this, though, to kind of create new neural connections and strengthen them is to engage in activities that are rhythmic, that are relational, that are fun, that are rewarding, and repetitive. So think about what some of those might be. Things like taking a walk, exercising, cooking, drawing, sewing, praying, all of these different types of activities that we may not automatically think of as being stress relieving are ways that we can get ourselves into a more regulated state. Which, by the way, this does not always mean calm. The goal of nervous system regulation is not achieving like this zen-like yoga teacher state, right? We want our nervous systems to be flexible, to be adaptive, to respond to what's going on around us. We want to create a more sort of flexible, sustainable system of stress response. And we can do that by engaging in these activities. So if you take sort of a playful attitude and think about some of the things that you engaged in, in a, as a child that you sort of lost time doing, things like swinging on a swing set or bouncing on a trampoline, all of these ways that we intuitively, even as children, find to regulate ourselves using sensory stimulation, using movement, using all of that kind of stuff. Two things to keep in mind as you consider how you might take some of this and apply it to yourself. First of all is dose. So we talked about the dose of stress being really important, right? The dose of nervous system regulation needed in order to soothe the stress response is actually really short. And we get that wrong when we tell ourselves that we need to devote like, entire days to self-care. I'm going to take a self-care day. I'm going, to I'm going to go to this retreat. I mean, none of this is realistic for me. It might be for some of you in the room. But we don't have hours to devote to this stuff, and so we don't do any of it. In Reality, though, if you've done that, if you've left your home or work and gone and did the thing that helps you to feel more nourished, more sustained, more like you, more regulated, and then you go back home to mess, to work emails, to kids fighting, dinner needing to be made, whatever the case may be, the stress response is activated again, right? Our nervous systems are recalibrating all the time. And so it's actually a lot more sustainable to build in these short couple minute practices multiple times throughout the day rather than kind of storing up this time to go do this thing once and come home and get stressed out again. Does that make sense to folks that are in the room? The other thing to think about is structure. So as you're kind of exploring your own stress response, you're exploring your nervous system, you'll know that there are certain activities, there are certain places, there are certain people who may activate you naturally. So how might you build in three minutes of nervous system regulation before you have to transition into that space? How might you build in three minutes after a tricky conversation or just stressful situation or stressful environment in order to kind of bring yourself back into a more regulated place before you go about the rest of your day.
So as social workers, we engage in so many different types of practice at so many different levels that really are all related to building resilient brains, which leads to building resilient communities. So if you are working to reduce implicit bias, like Dr. Fletcher talked about a few weeks ago, or you're working to reduce lead exposure, like Dr. Fisher talked about last week, or you're working on community building, like Dr. Chupp will talk about next week, all of us are kind of engaging in these practices that within the HOPE framework helps to build these relational buffers against trauma and adversity. And what I love about this framework is that it really highlights the fact that you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. There are so many ways that we can work with one another, that we can work with communities to provide relational connection, to provide that buffer, to build more resilient brains. Okay, so you may have noticed that little neurosequential network logo on a few of my slides. Um, I'm really excited to share that we have partnered with the neurosequential network and Dr. Bruce Perry to create an opportunity for our second year on ground students to engage in a year of coursework that allows them to complete the requirements in order to become certified in NMT. There's also a fellowship opportunity where select students are able to complete their field placement as in a site that utilizes this model. Uh, there's a scholarship that's added to that piece too. But the idea being they get this kind of holistic, comprehensive experience. Uh, much of the information that I shared today, reflected on the slides that I borrowed from the NeuroSequential Network, uh, relate to the content that we cover in the courses. So we're talking about neurodevelopment, we're talking about adversity, we're talking about maltreatment, we're also talking about resilience and relational health. So a piece of it is kind of this content and learning how to apply it to the complex cases that many of us see in practice, but there is also the NMT clinical to practice tools or the NMT metric, where you are able to obtain information about a child and family's a history of adversity and also their history of relational connectedness to kind of get a sense of their journey and also their uh, ability to kind of engage in different types of interventions. Maybe the coolest part of the training in NM team, being able to utilize NM team metrics, is that you are able to create a functional central nervous system brain map that you may notice kind of looks like that upside down pyramid that I was talking about earlier, right? So what we're able to get a sense of is what parts of the brain have been impacted by a child's traumatic experiences, history of adversity, and how what might we as social workers, as collaborative partners in serving kids and families, prioritize interventions that are going to target that area of the brain. So if we're able to, in this particular case, provide some support in the brain stem, that will make it easier again for us to access the limbic system, and when we do that, then we can get to the cortex. So that might mean, instead of referring a kiddo for cognitive behavior therapy, first, we're making sure they have sensory supports, and we're making sure that they have access to an occupational therapist, or a drumming class, or animal-assisted therapy therapies and things like that. Um, so it's a really exciting model that we're really happy to be able to bring to our students and bring to the Mandel School. So that's all I've got. Okay.